Ready to go, Kyle? Sure, let's do it. Cool. So welcome back, everybody, to our last afternoon session. I'm pleased to introduce Kyle Ormsby of Reed, who will tell us about Hochschild homology, classical, topological, and motivic. Thanks, Kyle. Uh all right, thanks a lot, Ben, and uh, thanks to all of the organizers. This has been a pleasure to participate um, remotely um, with folks uh, in Toronto and uh, Bonn and uh, across the globe. So um, kudos. Uh, I think this is a really neat way to put things together, and um, I wish I could be there in person, um, but instead I am joining you from my parents' dining room in St. Louis. So uh, my goal today is to tell you something about a new project involving uh, an object we call motivic Hochschild homology. Um, I I'm gonna, or at least the initial plan was to tell you something about um, the classical version uh, the topological version, and then work up to uh, motivic. Um, I, I think we won't do classical. I, you know, I've been here all week, and it seems like everyone is a uh, expert in Hochschild homology. So we'll probably skip over that and uh, focus on these two versions. So um, as I mentioned, um, this is uh, part of a new project that's joint with uh, Bjorn Dundas, Mike Hill, and Paul Arne Ostfer. Um, and uh, it's been in the works for a while. Uh, I think this started when I was a grad student and visited Paul in uh, Oslo. Um, but we've gotten around to writing things up and you can find uh, here um, our preprint on the uh, archive. So um, I'll kind of indicate a few places where uh, extra details are contained in that document. Um, and uh, we'll just get going here. But as mentioned, um, we're just we're just skipping this. That's the long version of this talk. Okay, so what is topological Hochschild homology? Um, let's start with a ring spectrum R. Um, then we can form THH of R um, as uh, this smash product of R with itself over R smash R op. Um, so if you think of this algebra geometrically, um, there's a really nice interpretation of this as a kind of derived self-intersection of spec R with itself. Um, and that's probably the right way to conceptualize it today. Um, we will um, often specialize to the case where um, we want to take R to be a classical commutative ring. Um, and in that case, when we say THH of A, um, where A is that ring, we really mean THH of the associated eilenberg maclean spectrum. Um, now, uh, when R is uh, commutative or E infinity, um, we are also able to think of THH as uh, the tensor product of uh, the circle as a simplicial set with R. Um, here we're using that spectra are tensored over simplicial sets, and this, um, this arises from kind of the standard presentation of the circle as um, taking an interval and gluing its endpoints together. So uh, that's THH, and uh, I'm going to review a computation of um, Marcel Bachstedt, uh, something that really got this whole uh, game off the ground. Um, and in particular, look at the case where um, A is uh, the ring F2, the, the field with two elements. Um, so the, the computational tool that we have um, here, we're commutative. So it's the smash product over HA smash HA. Um, and uh, when we have a smash product like this, we have an associated Tor spectral sequence. Um, so uh, the E2 page for this thing um, looks like Tor um, over the homotopy groups of the thing we're tensoring over, HA smash HA, um, and then the homotopy groups of the factors. Uh, but in this case, um, the homotopy groups of that eilenberg maclean spectrum are just A in degree zero. So that's, that's why we have this um, as those two entries. Um, and the spectral sequence converges to uh, THH of A, um, where of course here, I mean the, the homotopy groups of the spectrum we introduced earlier. Uh, I've written down uh, the differential, and uh, we'll come back to uh, kind of the, the combinatorics of how those degrees interact in a moment. Um, but let's see what the algebra is here. What is this, this Tor term in the case where A is F2? So in that case, um, we're looking at uh, Tor over 
the homotopy groups of HF2 smash HF2, in other words, the dual Steenrod algebra, and uh, by Milner, um, that is a polynomial algebra in these classes Xi, where Xi has degree two to the i minus one. Um, so uh, it's a great homological algebra exercise. If you take Tor over a polynomial ring of F2 comma F2, um, that ends up being an exterior algebra um, with one generator mu i for each uh, polynomial generator Xi. I. Um, so here the degrees are, uh, well, the internal degree is the same as Xi i's, but these are in homological degree one. Um, and I've drawn a little picture of that. Um, so just to recall, here's the E2 page. Um, and in this picture, um, I've drawn a dot where each of these uh, mu i's or a product of mu i's lives. Um, and I've labeled them so that this class is mu one, this class is mu two, this class that's labeled one two is mu one times mu two. Um, et cetera. And if you look over here, you can find mu1 times mu2 times mu3. Of course, since this is exterior, um, we don't have any squares of elements. Um, all right. And the way that I have indexed thing here, things here, I have um, h plus t, um, so homological uh, plus internal degree on the horizontal axis. Um, I have homological degree on the vertical axis. And in this setup, the differentials go one to the left and down. Okay. Um, but note here that uh, in this setup, we have one class in each even degree. Um, and so this spectral sequence has to collapse at the E2 page. Um, the upshot is that E2 is equal to E infinity. Um, we might be tempted to say, okay, the, the THH is then this exterior algebra on the mu i's, um, but there are a uh, very rich class of hidden extensions. Uh, namely, you can use uh, power operations, the dyer lashoff operations and the Steenrod algebra or dual Steenrod algebra um, to show that mu i squared is actually mu i plus one. Okay, on the level of homotopy groups. So those are hidden extensions. Um, and that then gives our theorem due to Bockstedt um, that uh, the THH of, well, here I did F2, the story for FP is very similar, um, and it ends up being uh, FP adjoin mu, where that class mu is the, the mu1 um, that we have in the E2 page. Okay, um, so uh, many in the room are probably familiar with that. I'm going to do a, a much more elaborate version of this computation in the motivic setting, so I wanted to make sure um, we all had it fresh in our memories. Um, so what is this motivic Hochschild homology? Um, well, it's going to be a very similar construction, but done in motivic spectra instead of topological spectra. Um, so in motivic spectra, we'll replace that eilenberg maclane spectrum with what I'm denoting MA, the motivic eilenberg maclane spectrum for A. Um, and uh, it's happening in this world of motivic spectra. What's that? Um, we haven't talked much about it this week, so I'll, I'll go through um, the setup. Um, we start with motivic spaces, and motivic spaces start lives as their life as um, simplicial presheaves um, on uh, the category of smooth uh, schemes over K, um, where K is some base field that we've uh, fixed. Um, and that's a nice category. Um, inside of it, we've got uh, via the UNEDA embedding uh, smooth schemes um, and uh, via uh, taking constant presheaves, um, we also have simplicial sets. Uh, so that's great. Um, but we want to remember some of the topology. And so we start to localize. Um, and in this case, we uh, first do a Nisnevich localization. So we have these simplicial presheaves. I forgot an op. There we go. Um, and uh, to Nisnevich localize, 
uh, well, these pre-sheaves have um, stocks relative to this thing called uh, the Nisnevich topology. Um, and we want to say that uh, when those stocks uh, relative to the Nisnevich topology are equivalent to simplicial sets, homotopy equivalent or weak equivalent, um, then uh, we'll declare uh, the map to be a weak equivalence. Um, so that's what Nisnevich localization is without getting in to the details of the Nisnevich topology. Um, and then uh, we do a further step um, we also A1 localize. Um, so that's a construction that says that uh, the affine line is contractible. Um, so we can kind of uh, build in these naive A1 homotopies um, that look like um, X cross A1 to Y, um, making maps equi uh, weakly equivalent. Um, all right. And uh, after we do those two model categorical localizations, um, we end up with the morel voivodsky category of uh, motivic spaces over our base field. Um, now, that's a, that's a nice construction, but it's, it's not stable homotopy theory yet. It's not something that, for instance, uh, represents cohomology theories. Um, in order to do that, we also need to invert uh, smashing with the projective line. Um, so we can form P1 spectra um, and uh, then get the category of motivic spectra that I'm denoting SP sub K. Um, all right. Uh, so this is um, the stable motivic homotopy world. Um, and inside of it, um, we have two classes of spheres. Um, so if you've seen a talk on motivic homotopy, you've probably seen uh, this diagram here. And uh, what we're seeing is that P1 is two copies of A1, it's northern and southern hemispheres, um, that are glued together along a punctured copy of A1. Um, so that's the standard push-out presentation of the projective line. Um, and in this setting, um, both of these copies of A1 are contractible. Um, and since they are contractible, um, we then see that P1, this term down here, is in fact a simplicial suspension of uh, A1 minus the origin. Um, great. Well, now we have this invertible object that actually has two smash factors. So that means that both of those factors are invertible as well. Um, one of them is this simplicial circle. The other one is the geometric circle. And this leads us to the bi-graded class of spheres, S, M, N, where M is the total degree, N is the weight. And um, you can see the numerology of that here. So the weight gives you the number of geometric circles. Um, the total degree gives you the total number of simplicial and geometric circles taken together. Um, all right. And uh, we now have these extra classes in the Picard group of the stable motivic homotopy category. And so, of course, we'll, we'll bi-grade our homotopy groups um, when X is a, a motivic spectrum over K. Um, now, these aren't quite sufficient for detecting weak equivalences, um, unless you're in maybe like a cellular subcategory. Um, for that, we would need homotopy sheaves. Um, that won't enter in too much to the rest of the discussion. So um, I'll just leave that as a note. Um, OK, um, why would we do this? Well, uh, a lot of important cohomology theories are representable in this category um, to go through kind of the standard hit list. Um, motivic cohomology is representable in this world. Um, so is homotopy algebraic K theory, um, as is Hermitian K theory. Sorry. Um, Siri is talking to me now. This is great. I don't know how to make that stop. Anyway, um, we also have uh, algebraic cobordism, uh, which is denoted MGL, which is constructed as a, a Tom spectrum, the same as you would um, MU. Uh, okay, and uh, uh, so it's a, it's a rich and interesting world where we can do um, kind of algebra topological computations on algebra geometric objects. Um, and in particular, um, we can make a, a de definition completely analogous to the one that we made um, for THH. 
Um, and when we have a commutative ring A, um, we will say that the motivic Hochschild homology of that ring is uh, this smash product, uh, which for formal reasons is again um, the circle uh, tensor MA. Um, so here uh, we are using the motivic spectra are tensored over simplicial sets. Um, they're also tensored over motivic spaces. Um, so just as a little uh, side thought, if you want to daydream during this talk, um, what would happen if we took our other circle and tensored it with MA? Um, I have no idea, but I think it's an interesting question. Um, all right, but back to what we're interested in right now, um, let's, uh, let's try to compute this motivic Hochschild homology. Um, in other words, compute its bigraded, the bigraded homotopy groups of this spectrum. Um, this is probably a good spot for me to pause. Um, if anyone has questions, feel free to jump in. Hey, Kyle, this is Jonathan Beardsley. Uh, regarding your daydreaming from the previous slide, um, <clears throat> if you're tensoring with uh, A1 minus origin, is that going to be basically the same as tensoring with S0 in some way? Or um, So S0 that... is a good intuition to have if you're working over the, the real numbers. Um, over the I complex see. numbers, A1 minus the origin is more like a circle. Um, I see. Right. Um, you know, one of the limitations here is we don't have, you know, that that cute little um, push out diagram um, right. representing A1 minus the origin. This this is some kind of weird, totally disconnected, um, you know, scheme um, in the, the motivic world. So uh, it's not clear how to access it computationally. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just I just wanted to know what, what your tensor like what the category is trying to tensor with the GM in. Uh, I couldn't quite hear you. You asked something about the tensor. No, oh, what what category are you trying to tensor with GM in? Oh, uh, this is in the category of motivic spectra. Um, so here, uh, my claim is that motivic spectra are tensored and co-tensored over uh, motivic spaces. All right. Um, I can't quite tell if there are other questions out there. Just interrupt me if there are, uh, but I'll continue. Um, so uh, here's a theorem. Um, so this is uh, what uh, Bjorn and Mike and Paul Arna and I prove in our paper. Um, let's fix an algebraically closed field, K, um, and let's take A, uh, the finite field with P elements, where P is not the characteristic of K. Um, and remember, uh, when we did that, uh, that A for THH, we got a very nice polynomial ring over FP. Um, for MHH, the answer is, um, I can only say wildly more complicated. Um, although it does have uh, some remnants of that older computation hiding inside of it. Um, so let me step you through uh, this theorem statement. Um, so I'm saying here that uh, the motivic Hochschild homology um, has a presentation where you look at the polynomials over FP generated by a class tau, um, classes mu i that are very related to that exterior algebra we saw earlier, um, and also classes XSF. Um, and there are a lot of these classes. Um, there is one for each uh, endo function of the natural numbers that has finite support, um, along with a subset of that support. Um, so just huge number of generators. Um, and then there are relations. So um, we no longer have that mu i to the p is mu i plus one. Um, instead, that's twisted by um, this, this tau to the p minus one that fixes weights. Um, we have that all of these X classes are tau to the P minus one torsion. Um, and we also have uh, these relations amongst the X classes 
uh, where XSF times XTG is equal to this uh, weird sum of other X's times uh, some scalars. Um, so that's, uh, that's pretty gnarly. Um, and not only is it gnarly, I, I haven't even told you what that scalar is yet. I need another slide to do that. So I shrunk down the theorem statement. Um, and here's the definition of the epsilon u's. Um, they're the sum of these k classes, which are these um, absolutely ridiculous products of binomial coefficients. Um, so I encourage you to not waste your time uh, unpacking that right now, although um, there's certainly some interesting stuff going on if you want to look at the paper later. Um, instead, uh, let's just observe that, uh, okay, more is going on now. Um, and what I want to do with the rest of the talk is um, first uh, tell you the shape of this computation when P is equal to two. Um, and secondly, highlight some consequences in motivic homotopy theory. Um, all right, I see a question in chat from uh, Doran. It says, if we set tau equal to one, we get something like THH. Um, what is the other end of the deformation, tau equals zero? Um, great question. Um, and I hope that um, what I'm about to present will, um, will help answer that. But come back to it, because um, I think it's, it's a really valuable perspective. OK, um, so here's how we're going to do it. Um, we've got uh, a Tor spectral sequence. Um, everything is cellular um, via um, some older results in motivic homotopy theory due to Hopkins, Morel, and Hoi Wah. Um, and so we'll need to know uh, the homotopy groups of the smash factors, and we'll need to know the homotopy groups of the thing we're smashing over. So over this algebraically closed field, um, the homotopy groups are uh, F2 adjoined tau, where tau is this class in degree zero minus one. Um, and uh, great, there it is. That's nice and simple over algebraically closed fields. The uh, motivic dual Steenrod algebra, um, well, we have the coefficients F2 adjoined tau, um, and now we have classes Xi and tau i. Um, so uh, this is a little bit more like the odd primary dual Steenrod algebra and topology. Um, and we have this uh, relation that when we square tau i, we get um, tau times Xi plus one. Um, and I've written the, uh, the degrees down here. Um, great. Uh, our steps will be as follows. Um, the first thing we'll do is calculate um, what you can think of as the etal motivic Hochschild homology, um, which you get when you invert tau. Um, so I was pestering Akil with the questions about this because it's the perspective we take um, in, in this paper. Um, when we invert this, we're uh, kind of looking at topological or etal information. And um, we show that uh, that's the uh, same thing as THH of F2 uh, adjoin uh, Laurent polynomials with the generator tau. Um, second step, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you that computation in just a bit. Second step, um, we'll also look at the mod tau uh, motivic Hochschild homology. So Doran's question completely anticipates the strategy here. Um, mod tau, we'll see that uh, this MHH is a divided powers algebra on these mu i bars, tensor and exterior algebra on uh, these lambda i bars. Um, steps three through five, I'm not going to say more about today. I'll send you to the paper for that. Um, step three is to check that that tau torsion actually injects um, in, or sorry, tau torsion in the motivic Hochschild homology injects into this mod tau computation uh, with image the tau box team. Um, step four is to um, do some very fancy bookkeeping um, and give a presentation of that tau torsion in terms of those, those X classes. Um, and step five is then to combine those two pieces um, via a pullback square and get the final answer. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you about step one and step two right now. Um, so uh, Tor over uh, this ring isn't so bad because when we invert tau, um, sure, we've got this relation, but now uh, tau i squared is a unit times Xi plus one. So we can solve for Xi plus one in terms of tau and the tau i's. And this just ends up being a polynomial algebra over the tau i's. 
Um, so the Tor spectral sequence has E2 page that I've written here. Um, and now, uh, again, some homological algebra, uh, you need to check that Tor over this um, essentially polynomial algebra looks like this exterior algebra adjoin uh, tau and tau inverse. Um, so we have the spectral sequence, and it converges to the etal motivic Hochschild homology. Um, and uh, degree considerations, again, will show you that uh, the spectral sequence collapses at the E2 page. Um, and uh, some power operations arguments, and this takes a little more work, um, imply that uh, mu i squared is tau times mu i plus one. Okay, and uh, the upshot then is that the Etel motivic Hochschild homology um, is basically the old answer, right? It's basically um, the uh, topological Hochschild homology with just this extra tau and tau inverse along for the ride. Um, now, what I've drawn here is actually the image of the integral motivic Hochschild homology inside of this tau inverted motivic Hochschild homology. Um, and I like this picture because then you can see how um, these uh, uh, mu i's have um, some extra tau divisibility. OK, so that takes us to step two. Um, now we're going to do the mod tau computation. Um, and here, when we, when we kill tau, right, remember um, we had uh, tau i squared was equal to uh, tau times xi i plus one. So if we're killing tau, then all of these tau i's become exterior. Um, and so this dual Steenrod mod tau is polynomial tensor exterior. And so the Tor spectral sequence um, ends up looking like, uh, well, we're taking Tor over this business um, and the polynomial contributes this exterior algebra, and this exterior algebra uh, contributes this divided powers algebra, just the standard homological algebra yoga. Um, and this will converge to the mod tau motivic Hochschild homology. Um, here, uh, with significantly more work, the, the degree um, wrangling is harder. Uh, nonetheless, you can show that for degree reasons, there are no differentials um, and also no hidden extensions in this case. And so uh, we learn that the motivic Hochschild homology mod tau just is this exterior tensor divided powers. Um, OK. Um, and then uh, we kind of stitch everything together and get the answer that I told you about. Um, so finally, um, I want to tell you about the consequences for motivic homotopy, which I think are fascinating. So uh, recall that. Um, THH of a finite field um, actually is an HFP module. And so you get this additive splitting of THH as a wedge of suspensions of HFP. Um, in the motivic setting, um, this can't be true. We just showed that there is this incredibly rich class of tau torsion classes. Um, that's not what the coefficients of MFP look like. They, they have a polynomial generator tau. And so we know that um, MHH of FP is not a free um, MFP module. Um, and uh, OK, so something must be different about the motivic world. Um, in spectra, uh, topological spectra, um, the following are true. First, um, Maholt's theorem says that uh, HF2 is a Tom spectrum. Um, the Bloomberg Cohen Schlick uh, Schlick theorem um, tells you how to compute THH of a Tom spectrum. Um, it says that it's the Tom spectrum smash the classifying space of its base along with the disjoint base point. Um, and then uh, you have James splitting, which says that, uh, well, if you take a uh, classifying space of the base for the Tom spectrum, um, it's a wedge of spheres stably. Um, OK. Uh, if all three of these were true, motivically, we would get this style of result for motivic Hochschild homology. And so the upshot is uh, that at least one of the following three things is false 
in the motivic setting. Um, so it could be the case that um, MF2 is not a Tom spectrum. It could be the case that MHH of a Tom spectrum does not split in the way that uh, THH of a Tom spectrum splits. Um, or it could be the case that um, the classifying space of the base over here um, is not a wedge of spheres stably. Um, so that would be some version of uh, GM or A1 minus the origin, uh, James splitting in the motivic world. Um, so our computation shows that at least one of those is going to fail. Um, and uh, I have my own suspicions, but you know, since this is a very technological conference, um, I thought um, I may as well gather um, your opinions as well. So um, you should be able to scan this QR code, um, or if you uh, if you pull out your phone or laptop and go to app.sly.do and enter this code, uh, Motivic Hawk Shield. Um, I am also going to um, put that link in the uh, the talk resources uh, channel on the Discord right now. Um, and I hope that you'll log on immediately, like right now, um, and let me know uh, which one of these is most likely to be false. Um, so the slide is set up um, to do a, a, a ranking of those three things. Um, and maybe after the Q&A, um, I'll go back and uh, and check on everyone's answers and reveal the, the community consensus on uh, which one of these is the most the most false. Um, so uh, I'll leave that up for a second. Um, I'll actually come back to this slide. Th that's all I have to share today. Thank you for your attention. Um, and I am more than happy to take questions.